that's what Disc is doing. That just doing hardscape and then plants and RODI water. Yeah. Too, so. Um, what do you think? Uh, what do you think uh, the pH or well, we didn't get to pH. We're about to talk about pH. What do you think the alkalinity is going to be like in RO water? Probably zero. Eight point five. Well, <laughs> it's going to be It's going to have low, very low alkalinity because uh, it's going to get a little alkalinity as soon as you put it out there and expose it to the air, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, but it's going to have low alkalinity in general, uh, purified water, because there's not any source for those carbonate and bicarbonate ions yet. Uh, so our next topic, pH, CO2, and buffers. Um, what's pH? You've all heard the term, you've all probably tested pH at some point, whether you have a swimming pool or a fish tank or took a science class once, probably did a pH test. What is pH? The available hydrogen atoms. I don't remember what P stands for. So there's actually uh, not total agreement on what the P stands for okay. uh, because it comes from uh, it. Uh, I think there was like a German and a French scientist both sort of worked on developing uh, this idea of pH and the pH scale. And if you take you know the French. Um, the, the translation from French, it, it stands for power. We usually say the power of hydrogen. The H definitely stands for hydrogen. The P stands for either power or proportion of hydrogen, depending on which source you read. Um, but it's basically a measure of the hydrogen ion concentration. But what, what does that mean? And where does the hydrogen come from? Well, certain things dissolved in water will give off hydrogen ions, but uh, but hydrogen ions end up even in a pure water sample. Where do they come from? Um, can they come from outside sources such as the such as the if they have creatures living in the from what? The yeah, a lot of biological activity can change the pH of water. And if you change the pH of water, then you've changed the concentration of the hydrogen ions in water. Um, so what we're measuring, most people think of it as measuring the, the acidity or basicity of water. We, when we talk about pH, we're talking about acids and bases. Um, this is uh, basically what we're talking about with, with a, an acid, a chemical compound that releases hydrogen ions into the water or somehow increases the proportion of hydrogen ions. Uh, a base decreases in some way hydrogen ions in a solution. So if it's something that will chemically bond with, if it, if it attracts and bonds with hydrogen ions, it's going to... Uh, reduce the hydrogen ion concentration. There's no less hydrogens there, but they're not free ions anymore. Now they're chemically bound to something. Um, when acid gives off hydrogen ions, a base accepts or decreases the amount of free hydrogen ions. Um, we use the pH scale uh, to talk about acidity or basicity, pH. Neutral a neutral pH is pH of 7. And the lower you go, the more acidic it becomes. So acids have low pHs. Bases, the opposite of acids, uh, have a high pH. And so uh, a lot of times when you're, when you're thinking about something being more and more acidic, it's counterintuitive to have the number going down. So you have to kind of uh, make yourself a little chart to help remember this. Um, so the lower the number, the more acidic. And it's not just as simple as that, because the pH scale, which goes from 0 to 14, and it goes from 0 to 14 because very few things that we deal with have a pH outside of those numbers. But you can have a negative pH, and you can have a pH above 14. But it's, it's very uncommon. 
So the pH scale goes from 0 to 14. It's a measure of the hydrogen ion concentration. And again, more acidic means the hydrogen ion concentration is greater, but the number is lower. It's a lot to keep track of, and it gets confusing. So make yourself a little uh, reference chart using some arrows, maybe, that says uh, increase in, we abbreviate hydrogen ion H+, plus. an increase in hydrogen ion concentration equals a decrease in pH equals an increase in acidity. What's the point? And it gets even more complicated because those numbers, we said what we're really measuring is the hydrogen ion concentration, pH scale. This is all about how many of these are free in the water. So each number difference on here equals a 10 times difference in the concentration. So a solution with a pH of 6 has 10 times the hydrogen ion concentration as a solution with a pH of 7. A solution with a pH of 5 has 100 times the, ion, the hydrogen ion concentration as a solution with a pH of 7. A pH of 4, that's 1,000 times the hydrogen ion concentration as something with a pH of seven. So it's a logarithmic scale, it's a, and it's a negative logarithmic scale because the lower the number, the higher the concentration. So sometimes some astute student asks, what's with all this negative log stuff? What, why, if you're measuring the concentration, why not just say it in the concentration, like parts per million or milligrams per liter or something like that? Why does it have to be the negative log? So technically, the definition of pH, it's the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration of a solution. Why does life have to be so complicated? Why not just give the flat out hydrogen ion concentration? Can anyone answer? I don't think we're able to measure it, are we? Like down that low and it can't specifically... Well, volume. we can measure it, and that's what the pH scale is it's indicating, our measure of it. But so why not just express it in the flat-out concentration? So high or low? So, well, it's because the concentration is so low that something like parts per thousand can't capture it, or even parts per million. Um, we have to measure it, and we use this in chemistry very often, very, very, very small concentrations of certain molecules can have a giant impact on the chemistry of a system. So the, the concentrations are so low and the variation in, is so great that we had to come up with this special scale. The variation between a pH of 0 and a pH of 14. What we use to measure these very low concentrations, has anyone ever taken a chemistry class? What do you measure concentrations of molecules in? in a solution. That's empty. Uh, anyone ever heard of a mole? Yes. Right? We call it the molar concentration, which is moles per liter. What's a mole? Uh, a mole is the... It's a little underground rodent that kills your vegetables. But in chemistry, a mole is what? It's, an, it's a measurement describing it's not a measurement a mole itself is not a measurement it's what it's what how how many it's meant to represent one one right come up and one you're you're trying you're you're trying to express i think Concentration, molar concentration. A mole itself is a number. It's a word for a number, like a dozen is a word for 12. It always means the same. A mole is a number of molecules, but it's a, it's a really big number. There's not even, we don't even have a name for the number, like million or billion. You know, there's a lot of giant numbers that we don't have specific names for. 
Um, but uh, the mole is a number, and this is the number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So you'd have to move the decimal place over 23 spaces to get what that number was. Why couldn't they use uh, a factor of 10? Why do they have to? What's the 6.02 stuff? So uh, it's based on the, the uh, atomic mass of, of uh, certain elements or of, of elements in general. They, it started with the hydrogen atom. So if you take exactly one precisely measured gram of hydrogen, and the fact that I'm saying hydrogen has nothing to do with the hydrogen and pH, but hydrogen, the smallest, simplest element with a mass, an atomic mass of one, if you take exactly one gram of hydrogen, that's how many hydrogen atoms there are. Or if you take carbon is atomic number uh, six, it has a but it has a, it has a uh, mass, carbon has an atomic mass of what? Anyone know? Normal carbon has an atomic mass of 12. If you take um, exactly 12 grams of carbon, that's how many carbon atoms are there. So, uh, and we use this, so we use this as a, as a general um, number for measuring numbers of atoms or molecules, and it, it also tells us something about how much mass is there, too, if you know the molecular or atomic mass of the particle that you're looking at. So, um, what the number means, it's the, it's the molar concentration, so it's how many moles of hydrogen ions in one liter of a solution. So if we say, um, if we say the pH is 7, for example, as it is in pure water, typically, what the pH of 7 means is that, um, and we get it, it says the negative log, it's the molar concentration. That's a big number. How many moles do you think there are in one liter? How many That's moles of, of, of water? Well, there's a lot, right? So, um, in one liter of water, the number of moles of hydrogen ions at a pH of 7 is um, 1 times 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter. How many is that? That's, this is uh, 0. Point Two, three, four, five, six. There's that many moles per liter. So, and what is that? That's a uh, ten hundred thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand, million, ten, one ten millionth of a mole of hydrogen ions per liter of solution. So, if you wanted to express pH in flat out concentration, You'd have to say, well, instead of saying pH 7, you'd say there's one ten millionth of a mole per liter, or one times 10 to the negative seventh moles per liter, um, which is a mouthful, and it's a pain in the neck to write, and it's much easier to just write a pH of 7. I know I went off on a very long tangent to express all that, but, uh, it you know, sometimes when you're trying to study and remember all this stuff, you get angry thinking of, why does it have to be so complicated? I always did. I hated chemistry. Those things always didn't make sense to me, and I felt like if they got understood, if they got explained better and I understood better, I wouldn't get so angry trying to study and understand why, why, why the negative log. Um, so again, uh, a pH of six means that your hydrogen ion concentration is one times ten to the negative sixth. What hydrogen uh, moles of hydrogen per liter of solution? So where do these hydrogen ions come from anyway? That's another good question about pH. Glad I asked it. In pure water, water itself, the water molecule, right? It looks like this. And remember we said it forms hydrogen bonds with other water molecules around it. 
Why? Because there's an un uneven distribution of electrons around. So you have a slight negative charge here and a slight positive charge here and here. Negative charge. That charge difference between a hydrogen of one water and the oxygen of the other causes this little attraction. And sometimes that attraction pulls this hydrogen right off of that and you're left with a hydroxide ion, OH minus, and the hydrogen either free in solution or attached to this as what we call the hydronium ion, H3O. So we don't distinguish in pH whether we're talking about free hydrogens or H3O, the hydronium ion, they're uh, H3O plus, they're effectively the same. They're positive ions in solution uh, that, are, that have everything to do with hydrogen. So hydrogens are getting pulled away from other water molecules. In a sense, you can think of it as water is such a good solvent that it even dissolves itself. Because that's what's happening. That's what's happening is water is dissolving itself to pull these hydrogen ions away. So one thing that we know that has to be mathematical certainty is that in pure water, all of the hydroxides and all of the hydrogen ions could only have come from H2O. So for every hydrogen ion, there has to be a hydroxide ion. In pure water or in any solution that has a pH, a neutral pH, seven, there has to be the same number of hydroxide as hydrogen ions. So that's one thing you know about it. In a neutral pH, the number of hydrogen ions is equal to the number of hydroxide ions. Anything you do to change that proportion changes the pH. You could also, by convention we chose hydrogen ions, but you could also measure the pOH the power or proportion of hydroxide ions. By convention, we all just measure hydrogen ions because if you know the pH, you have to also know the pOH. It's the inverse. So again, our definition, the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Um, some pHs of common everyday things, right? Uh, things like milk and pure water right around neutral. Certain things become... Uh, are, are more and more acidic. Notice that we can drink pretty acidic things, vinegar and lemon juice and stuff. Um, that's what, where that tangy flavor comes from in a lot of the things we drink. I know I'm talking way too long about all this, but I have an interesting story that I have to tell you about pH because it, it's just, and it applies well to aquaculture. I'm driving down the road one day and I see this big plastic 55 gallon drum on the side of the road. And I think to myself, that could be a tank or a filter or something. I'm gonna pull over and pick this thing up and uh, take it and, and go do something with it. <clears throat> so I pull over, I get out of the car, a cop immediately pulls over because obviously I look like a terrorist up to no good on the side of the highway, uh, starts questioning me. I tell him what I'm up to, he says, all right, be careful. Don't blow anything up. And I take this big drum, and I don't know what's in it or if it's going to be useful, but um, the first thing I see when I, I roll it over and I see one of these labels on it that looks like this. So there's some kind of chemical warning label. Right? And uh, it says all over it, warning, dangerous, strong acid, do not ingest, um, and there's, this is the symbol on it. Looks like this. There's a hand getting dissolved by liquid. Danger, poison, do not, whatever, do not touch. Do not allow to come into contact with your skin. And so now I'm freaked out and I think I can't use this for fish. I don't know what this was, but this seems dangerous. And I stand it up and I unscrew one of the lids. And as I learned in chemistry lab, I don't stick my nose right over it. I put my face back and I do one of these. And as it comes toward me, I say, oh wait, that smells very familiar. Coca-Cola. Yeah, I, I, I roll it over and it says, 
Pepsi Cola flavoring component number one, phosphoric acid. So, I was in, when I lived in Virginia, they had a tractor trailer full of that crap, like crash, and it uh, they had to come back in and like resurface the rig. Yeah. Yeah, it, would be, it was so, like thousands of gallons. Of for it. those of you that drink that every day, just something to keep in mind. That's why I drink tea. Um, so, uh, yeah. Question. Yeah. So going back to the hydrogen atoms, is that why hydrogen ions? There. So they're hydrogen ions when they're dissociated from water in a solution. Go ahead. Um. So is that why in, say, like a very acidic water, we start to see ammonia turn into ammonium, where it's NH four instead of NH three? Because yeah, such an that's exactly why. And. Um, Dave's going to talk to you about that in a few minutes if I leave any time at the end of class. Maybe next week. Um, so, uh, yeah. The ammonia, ammonia is NH3. It's toxic. It kills fish. Ammonium ion, NH4, is much, much less toxic. So if you have a lot of hydrogen ions in solution, then those ammonia molecules pick up the extra hydrogen ions, become NH4, which is less toxic. So... This is why a lot of times you, you put a fish in a little bag and ship it, you know, 36 hours overseas, and even though the ammonia, they've released a lot of ammonia in the bag, they haven't died of ammonia poisoning because they're also lowering the pH as they breathe. Okay. How does lowering the, how does the pH get low as you breathe? Well, um, first of all, uh, let's go back to important topics and pH here, besides my side stories. Why, uh, so what things are acids and bases? Um, some common examples of acids and bases that we use in water chemistry or any kind of chemistry. Uh, what's a common acid? Name an acid that you've heard of. Lemon juice. <laughs> well, a, a specific, a chemical formula, a chemical oh. that you've used in a chemistry class or your swimming pool or, or resurfacing your garage floor or something. Boric acid. I don't know the chemical formula for that one offhand, but a very you've heard of um, you've heard of uh, muriatic acid with j just a commercial na fancy name for HCl, hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid uh, has a chemical formula HCl. That's one hydrogen bound to one chlorine atom. When it dissolves in water, um, they don't go their separate ways as atoms, they go as ions. The chlorine, uh, the chlorine is much uh, stronger at attracting electrons. We say it's more electronegativity, uh, elect electronegative, so it takes hydrogen's one electron with it and becomes the chloride ion, Cl-, and the hydrogen leaves its electron behind and goes as a hydrogen ion, not a hydrogen atom. So these two ions end up dissolved in water when you put HCl, hydrochloric acid, in water. It's an acid because it increases the hydrogen ion concentration without increasing the hydroxide ion concentration. So the definition of an acid. Uh, a common base that we use, sodium hydroxide, NaOH. When you dissolve sodium hydroxide in water, the sodium ion loses its electron. Oxygen is very electronegative. It has a strong affinity for electron. It takes that extra electron, and you have an OH minus. So sodium hydroxide increases the pH because it increases the proportion of hydroxide ions. How does that how does this decrease the number of hydrogen ions? Well, the more of these you put in, the more hydrogen ions are going to get attracted to them, and this is going to convert to, what, H2O. So you're decreasing. If you add hydroxide ions to a solution, you're always going to decrease the hydrogen ion concentration. So that's the case of NaOH, so HCl. What happens if you dissolve... NaCl, 
one ion from each of those others. This dissolves into Na plus sodium and Cl minus chloride ions. What would that do to the pH? Why would you say lower it? The negative chlorine is going to pull in a hydrogen, won't it? The negative, uh, the, the chloride ion could combine with a hydrogen ion and form HCl. But also, That's the it. positive sodium ion could combine with a negative hydroxide ion and form NaOH. And that, that could and would happen. But because there's one of each, it's not going to affect the proportion. So it's because it's not adding a hydroxide or a hydrogen ion, it's going to have no effect on pH. And this is our very definition of a salt. I don't mean, I don't mean the violent kind of a salt. I mean salt, the definition for a salt is any ionic compound that when you dissolve it in water releases Hydrogen, uh, that releases ions other than hydrogen and hydroxide. So if it, if it dissolves in water, dissociates into ions, and neither of the ions are hydrogen or hydroxide, that's how we define salt. HCl, uh, uh, NaCl, table salt, sodium chloride, is just one of many salts. Uh, what else do we have to cover here? pH. Um, Again, fresh water often is going to have a pH near neutral, um, but it's going to vary. The pH of uh, the tributaries of the Amazon where uh, discus live uh, and certain other cichlids is, is very acidic for living things. The pH is down around 5, uh, which is not acidic compared to gastric fluid or lemon juice, but it's acidic for most fish. Um, pH of seawater is a little bit higher. It's up usually over 8, around 8.2. Um, oh, so uh, any, any ionic compound that you dissolve in water uh, that's going to affect those proportions is going to change the pH. Um, CO2, though, has an effect on pH. What does CO2 do to the pH of a solution? It lowers it. it, lowers it. How can that be? Because look, we, we, it's clear to see why HCl lowers it. There's an H there. You can't, right? the H is going to be donated. It's easy to see why NaOH is going to affect it because there's an OH to be dissociated. It's easy to see why NaCl won't affect it at all because there's no H and there's no OH. So how about CO2? There's no hydrogen, there's no hydroxide. How can CO2 affect pH? CO2 itself is not an acid. Any ideas? So. Again, CO2 by itself is not an acid, but if you just blow a few bubbles of your breath, which is only, only has slightly elevated CO2, you blow just a few bubbles of your breath into a solution of water, the pH is gonna drop instantly. And here's why. CO, CO2, as soon as it dissolves into water, and it's very soluble. Did you ever wonder why all of our uh, fizzy drinks that we drink have dissolved CO2. Why not just use oxygen? Wouldn't that seem healthier? Get extra acid. oxygen. Carbonic acid is the answer we're about to get to. But why? Why don't we just oxygen? Why do we? Why don't we oxygenate our soft drinks? Why do we carbonate them? Do you know that there's about a thousand times more oxygen in the atmosphere than CO2? It seems like it would be cheaper. 
It's more oxygen than CO2 in the air all around. Why not just use air? Why not just blast it full of air and let it be the same mixture of nitrogen and oxygen and argon and CO2? Would that, that would be the cheapest thing, right? Just bubble the heck out of it. What? Uh, um, would it just be because uh, whenever you open it or just like explode? It kind of does explode when you open it. Yeah. Yeah. If you did use air, it wouldn't explode as much. The, the answer is because CO2 is about 30 times more soluble in water than oxygen. All these different gases. You ever, uh, so the atmosphere is over, it's almost 80% nitrogen. But if you look at the N2 concentration of water exposed to the air, it's pretty low compared to oxygen and CO2. So the solubilities of these different gases vary. CO2, CO2 is very soluble, 30 times more soluble in water than oxygen, about 50 times more soluble than nitrogen. So we carbonate our beverages with CO2 because you can get so much of it into solution and it stays fizzy. Your water wouldn't, your soda wouldn't stay fizzy with, uh, if you bubbled oxygen into it. You'd open it and all of, the, all of the fizz would be gone immediately. So when you do dissolve CO2 in water, and again, um, it dissolves very easily, a lot of it instantly combines with H2O in a chemical reaction to form this compound uh, draw in chemistry these double half arrows to indicate that the reaction can go both directions. It forms a compound called H2CO3. That's carbonic acid. Your soda is acidic not only because flavoring component number one is phosphoric acid, but all that carbonation makes a lot of carbonic acid. Now that's an acid because it has hydrogens to donate. And all on its own, this dissolves in a reversible reaction in solution to H plus, so it gives off a hydrogen ion, plus an HCO3 minus ion. This is called bicarbonate. Bicarbonate ion, HCO3 minus. And HCO3 bicarbonate also, all on its own, will dissociate into another hydrogen ion. So this can act as an acid. But notice the reaction can also go that way. So it can also act as a base and combine with the hydrogen ion to form carbonic acid. So bicarbonate can give off a hydrogen ion acting as an acid plus CO3 2 minus. Now uh, it has two extra electrons because it lost two hydrogen ions. This is called the carbonate ion. And when you have all of these things together in solution, as you do in most natural bodies of water, um, it forms what we call a buffer. Because if you were to add an acid, if you add a little HCl to this system with all of these ions present, then what happens is the extra hydrogen ions bond with these and these and push the whole reaction back this way. And if you add a base and it pulls out some of the hydrogen ions, then it pushes the reaction back this way. More carbonic acid forms, more carbonic acid dissociates. So the system can absorb some acid or base without showing much of a change uh, in pH. Uh, so this whole thing is an example of a buffer system, but this is how CO2 bubbled into water or just dissolved into water can lower the pH of the system by increasing the hydrogen ion concentration. So, uh, decaying organic matter can change pH. It 
invariably is going to drop pH in a couple of different ways. Just the formation, uh, just the, the decomposition of ammonia uh, is, a, is an, an acidifying process. But most of the bacteria that are breaking down the organics uh, also are respiring and giving off CO2, and that's going to form more carbonic acid. In fact, uh, when any living thing dies, and you know, in any living organism, aside from the water, carbon is the most abundant uh, atom in any living thing. All of the carbon in a living thing eventually ends up as CO2. So as things are breaking down, CO2 is getting released one way or another uh, back into the water, and that's going to have uh, an acidifying effect. Um, and a lot the chemical processes involved in breaking down um, uh, organic matter are going to lower pH in a couple of different ways. Um, how's this going to affect your fish? Well, first of all, every living thing is adapted to living within a set of parameters, right? Conditions of pH and salinity and temperature, and we cope with that by carrying around this whole sack of cells with us where our body is working constantly to maintain homeostasis and maintain a uh, constant pH and salinity and alkalinity and temperature in all of our body fluids because all of our enzymes are adapted to only really function within this narrow range of parameters. If we get outside of those parameters, we're very sick, right? Well, a lot of aquatic organisms, the things we culture, uh, don't have such a... Uh, what, they, they don't put as much effort into maintaining a lot of those parameters because they live in a body of water where those parameters are maintained. They cope by living in a place where those parameters stay within the range that's tolerable. If you take something outside of that range, it's good. If you take a tropical plant and leave it out in the winter, it's going to die. If you uh, take a, uh, you know, a cold water fish and put it in 80 degree water, it's going to die. Can't, so, and, and, and pH is just one of those parameters. Um, and so because aquatic organisms are interacting so much with the water around them, the pH around them is going to directly affect the pH of their blood. Ions are crossing into their blood through their gills. And so if they're in water uh, that has a very high or very low pH, it's going to affect the pH of their own, uh, their own body fluids. Um, so, uh, let's see. Bicar uh, this is uh, talking about bicarbonate ion um, is how uh, CO2 is transported and released from the body. So if, you're, if you throw off the pH in the water around a fish, then it makes it unable to get rid of the CO2 that's in its own blood, which it needs to. If your CO2 builds up in your blood, then uh, you're, you can't get rid of it. You're going you're gonna to die. Right. So the more CO2 in the water and the lower the pH, uh, the more difficult it's going to be to get rid of CO2. And another thing regarding this, we, we said that CO2 lowers the pH, but by the same token, lowering pH is going to increase the CO2 concentration. If you, if you add hydrogen ions, remember it's going to push the chemical reaction back in this direction, it's going to make more CO2 in the water. So even without adding CO2, if you lower the pH of water, the CO2 concentration is going to go up and that's going to make it difficult for fish to shed CO2. CO2 only can diffuse out of their gills if the concentration gradient is enormous. They have to have a very, very much lower CO2 concentration outside of their gills than inside of their blood or it won't leave their body. Um,
So um, you have a lot of organisms in your system, overcrowded system, uh, you can have CO2 buildup and drop in uh, pH. Um, if you put too much food in to your system, if you're overfeeding, uh, then that organic breakdown is going to also act to drop the pH. Um, again, the, the breakdown processes are lowering pH and the CO2 that's being given off is going to lower the pH. Um, if you have a lot of plants or phytoplankton in your system, well, plants are good, right? Plants absorb CO2, plants give off oxygen, while well, they also respire. So if your cell density of phytoplankton is very high, or if you have a lot of plants, that's all great during the day, but when the sun goes down or the lights turn off, they're still going to be respiring. They're still going to be giving off CO2. So in most systems, even in natural bodies of water, you see this variation in pH between day and night. And that's because photosynthesis is going strong all day, and then at night, photosynthesis stops, CO2 levels increase, the pH goes down. So most of the organisms we deal with can tolerate a daily variation in pH, but if your densities are very, very high, whether it's densities of your animals or plants or phytoplankton, it can cause that swing to be too great. Uh, three things are going to happen at night where you have a high density of plant life in your system or photosynthesizers in general. Oxygen levels are going to plummet at night, pH is going to plummet at night, and CO2 is going to go up. Those three are all connected uh, in this balance between respiration and photosynthesis. So, yeah. This may be off. Talking about at night when things change. Um, mimosa trees, photosynthesis. At night, they fold their leaves in. Is that a, is that a, um, are they conserving energy? Or They're conserving water. Conserving because water. Um, plants, uh, they take in water through their roots. Yeah. All of that water leaves through little pores in their leaves. And, and they so um, they need to have the leaves open for photosynthesis yeah. during the day. Mm -hmm. But um, if, especially if water is limiting, they curl up or close up their leaves. Some of those plants, even on a very dry day, or if they're, or if they're not getting enough water, will also fold up yes, their leaves. And that closes up. Um, they, they can also close the pores themselves, but in, a, in, in something like a, a mimosa is a, is a tree that will do that. They have very thin leaves that those pores can't close tight enough to prevent water loss. So they, they, they close them out as a water conservation. Water, okay. Um, you trying to grow one in this loss. You said with uh, anything photosynthetic, that's the case that the CO2 is going to rise significantly, the pH and the oxygen will lower significantly. Is that the same with coral when they're like. Yeah, in a reef tank, even if you have no plants at all. In a coral reef tank, your corals are all photosynthetic, but that's, you know, they have algae living in their tissues that are photosynthesizing all day. You're going to see a big pH swing. Uh, I had a friend, actually Dave and I have a friend, he worked in a lab up in New York and in a school, he had a, a nice aquaculture lab in a high school. And he noticed that he was getting a pH drop during the day, which is the opposite of what you see everywhere in aquaculture and what you see. His fish tanks were all getting uh, decreased pH during the day. All the lights were on, sunlight streaming through the windows, big metal halide lights on the reef tanks. And right when you'd expect your uh, highest pH of the day, in the middle of the day, he had, it, it was bottoming out and he couldn't figure out why. Who needs some extra credit? Come up. What's the answer? Why did you say credit? I said extra credit. If you can come up with the right answer, you get. I'll, I'll, I'll offer you okay, two you points say? of extra credit on you, on say? exam one. What did he say? Why did the pH drop during the day in Dan Elefante's lab in Southampton? Somebody tell me that answer. I don't know. I won't activate it. Is it the um, students being in the classroom breathing, releasing CO2, and having it? We have to give them two points. 
Yeah, because the population of not only the room, but the entire building increased. So even though there was all this photosynthesis going on, now you got a bunch of mouth breathers in the room putting out all this CO2, and the CO2 concentration in the room went way, way up. Um, I bet you on any given day in any classroom, if you just set out a little bowl of water and measured the pH right before anyone came in for the day, and then after sitting around with 20 people in the room for an hour, that the pH also would drop. But the, he had to, I mean, he had to take serious measures to control that pH drop during the day because it was significant. <laughs> Um, so some, one way we can deal with uh, increased CO2 where we have a, a lot, you know, high densities uh, is by degassing. You can degas simply by aerating. So if the, if the CO2 level is getting high enough, you, you know, you can, you can degas your soda like that too. You can shake the heck out of it and open it and suddenly you have flat soda. You've, um, by increasing the surface area of air to... Uh, or that, that air-water interface, uh, which you can do by shaking up or aerating, uh, you're going to allow that increased, any kind of gas, to gas off. Any, any gas that's building up will leave under aeration. We usually think of aeration as something to increase oxygen concentration. The atmosphere, you know, the uh, uh, oxygen concentration in the atmosphere is pretty high, so bubbling almost always will increase O2 concentration in water, but in gases where that differential is much different, um, you can you can gas off, especially if there's a CO2 buildup. So uh, straight out aeration, a paddle wheel just stirring things up. This is a degassing tower that sprays water and it, it cascades back down, so making a fine little bunch of water droplets. Uh, another type of degassing tower here. So these are all meant for removing CO2. Um, this just shows, this is uh, the effect of pH. Uh, so, oh, so we talked about alkalinity and buffering. We said when there's buffers present, um, it's going to decrease the ability, or it's, it's going to minimize changes in pH. So when you have buffers present, um, uh, it, it, counter it or it, it, it prevents big swings in pH. This is showing, uh, so what's HCO3, that's the bicarbonate ion, um, and Dave, read this graph. Uh, so I think what it's showing is that at the uh, low pHs, all of the Bicarbonate is bound up by hydrogens, right? So, and on the left side of the graph is low pH. So okay. H. So this, uh, sorry. So this line is pH, and this line is. Um, why are those lines? pH. I had no, those they're not. It's just dividing it up into what are what are. Oh, sorry. The pH is the here pH across the bottom. And, okay. And it's showing at those different pHs what is the amount of um, how how is the CO two carbonate and bicarbonate how is it divided up? So divided all right, up. so this graph is basically showing this whole yes. chemical equation here and the relationship. So as pH goes up, as you increase pH, more of the carbon is uh, going to be taken up as um, bicarbonate and carbonate with increasing pH. As the pH goes down, it's shifting the reaction back this way and it's pushing the carbon back into carbonic acid and CO2. So uh, you always hear about uh, people being alarmed about ocean acidification and uh, why coral reefs are dying and what that has to do with burning coal and Oil, you know, when we burn fossil fuels, we're releasing a tremendous amount of CO2 into the atmosphere, and it's very soluble in water. And so we're putting more and more CO2 into the atmosphere. The CO2 gets dissolved into seawater, and um, it acidifies the seawater. And it, what it does, as the 
even though seawater is a pretty good buffer, um, it can only take so much before the pH starts dropping. And when the pH drops, it decreases the number of available carbonate ions. The more hydrogen ions, the less carbonate ions. And corals and clams and snails and a lot of the algae that produce about half of the oxygen available in our atmosphere all build some kind of shell or skeleton out of calcium carbonate. They take calcium ions out of the water and they take carbonate ions out of the water. If you lower the pH of the ocean, you decrease the availability of carbonate ions, you're taking away the building blocks of those calcium carbonate skeletons and shells. And so uh, we're not all, and, and, and the whole process is, um, it's kind of a snowballing effect because the less ability those things have to photosynthesize, the less the oceans can absorb CO2 and the more CO2 builds up and the more acidic the ocean becomes. So that's why you hear marine scientists getting all freaked out about CO2 and ocean acidification all the time. Uh, pH, I'll let uh, we have here? pH uh, versus uh, CO2 concentration. Obviously, this is what we said before. The uh, both CO2 and pH are interdependent. You decrease or you increase the um, CO2, it decreases the pH. If you decrease the pH, it is going to increase the CO2 concentration, and that's all affected by alkalinity. Uh, great. Al adding having more alkalinity. Uh, increases the buffering capacity. Alkaline waters tend to resist changes in pH. So this is showing uh, changes in pH in a 24-hour period uh, in a body of water. In mid-afternoon, you have the highest pH. The sun is high in the sky. Early morning, uh, you have the lowest pH. It's been dark all night, no photosynthesis. So in low alkalinity water, you're going to get a much bigger swing between day and night than in high alkalinity water. Remember, high alkalinity um, in a solution is going to resist changes in pH. Make sure you memorize every number on this chart. Everyone? Just, uh, I'm just kidding. That's just a reference to uh, Okay, just make sure you remember all of that. Uh, and this just um, sh this just depicts this carbonate buffering system as we see it in uh, in seawater and how it affects the availability of carbonate for things like corals and coccolithophores and clams and oysters. Um, obviously, seawater has a higher alkalinity and higher pH uh, than freshwater because the carbonate ions in seawater don't only come from this this reaction. Carbonate ions are built up in seawater from billions of years of different kinds of minerals dissolving off of the continents and being deposited in seawater. So the, there's carbonate from mineral sources in seawater too, but still can only absorb so much CO2 before the um, pH starts dropping and it starts having serious effects on marine life. All right. In that video right there depicts. Oh, it's a video. Uh, it has how ocean acidification can impact aquaculture by looking at huge shellfish hatcheries on the west coast of the United States, Pacific Northwest, where they have even more um, change in pH because of the upwelling there, that how it affects their um, ability to produce shellfish larvae that are competent enough to metamorphose. So they basically have had to mechanically buffer their water on the way in before they can use it in their hatcheries. So that is for you to watch. That's a video. It's a video. So kind of going back to the disparity of of dissolved CO2 in lower fresh water being or lower pH water being higher than the amount of dissolved CO2 in higher pH water. Is that why, at least in my experience, I've tend to found, find a lot more like macroalgaes or like plants in fresh water like than salt water or is that they just adapt more? No, in fresh water, water you're dealing with not, not macroalgae like even though something like veil or you know or 
my, or uh, java fern might remind you of calerpa. They're, yeah. they're completely different organisms. They're in different kingdoms. So calerpa is technically a protist. It's an yeah. algae. Um, and you see very, very few vascular plants. Yeah, if, that's you, so, so the reason why uh, you see so many vascular plants in freshwater, this beautiful freshwater planted aquarium with, you know, 50 species of plant in it, mm -hmm. you don't have 50. It's because... Um, all of those vascular plants in fresh water um, evolved from land plants. They didn't, okay. they, you know, That's whereas the algae and things that live in salt water um, have been in salt water all along. Okay. Right? So algae eventually gave rise to land plants that went and colonized all of land and were adapted to absorbing fresh water out of the soil, but it takes a really big adaptation for those freshwater loving plants to now adapt back to salt water. So okay. really only have like three families of plants that can survive in salt water at all. The spartina and the mangroves and, and sea grasses. Okay. No other flowering plant can tolerate salt water like that. But okay. um, that makes I don't a lot of sense. sense. I always wondered why there was that difference. So thank you. I don't know how to stop this thing. Oh, then.